A very warm good evening to the galaxy of intellectuals, invited guests, professors, students, ladies and gentlemen. I am Dr. Kanika Sharma. It's a matter of immense pleasure to stand here before all of you this evening. I, on behalf of the Indian Society of International Law, once again welcome you all to the valedictory session of the three days ninth international ninth international conference on international law and changing global order organized by the indian society of international law new delhi to grace the occasion we have professor bharat desai sir professor jnu we welcome you sir professor anupam jha treasurer isil and professor delhi university professor vg hegre sir EC member ISIL and chairman of the organizing committee of 9th international conference uh, we welcome all the guests on the dais and off the dais i request uh, dr luther angrezi sir joint secretary ministry of external affairs government of india to kindly felicitate our guest of today's evening professor bharat desai sir Now I request Professor Desai sir to present valedictory address on the title Global Order in Perplexity Making International Law Work. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, it's really a pleasure and privilege for me to be here at uh, this uh, premier international law institution in the heart of uh, the city of Delhi. Uh, I'm a life member of this society, and uh, really, I'm I greatly appreciate. I'm touched by the gesture of my my, my former stu students, colleagues, and friends. You know, from 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 different areas. Uh, we have been, although I have been a, uh, you know, it's a very rare occasion when I when I come to this side of uh, Delhi. You know, like. Uh, very rarely some you know like asiatic lion rarely comes ventures out of uh, gear forest you know. so i rarely come it's almost some 20 years 20 years where i have not been barring some few occasions on a annual conference so it's again a, uh, uh, i greatly appreciate it. it's my special privilege you know to be here uh, to to be invited to address this validity you know session of the international conference of the indian society of international law now the task I, at my hand you know is uh, very simple. What I what I thought was, since this is an international conference where plenty of uh, teachers and students from different parts of India have assembled here, and I just had a chance to had a cursory look at the program of the uh, this two day program where uh, many sessions where different areas have been uh, you know sought to be you know touched upon by 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 different uh, scholars you know, and that uh, actually motivated me to 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 take a particular little approach you know that. Un unconventionally, like in you know, most of the validity address, where people uh, simply uh, uh, speak up, you know, in that. But I thought maybe I will. This is something what I will normally do in my international law law class, you know, because the very purpose of the Indian Society of International Law is to disseminate, uh, you know, teaching and research in the field of international law to promote awareness, you know, and about the uh, you know inter international law as an instrument of state policy that is exactly the and i have literally grown with this indian society of international law right from being a being a student here you know for years uh, together you know so with that hindsight with that advantage of being there you know i thought <coughs> this will little uh, make some sense you know uh, because the the world as we see today it's a, it's a, you know with a, you know witnessing a lot of lot of churning you know huge churning from different 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 uh, different dimensions from which you if you whichever dimension you you look at you know uh, it's a very very troubled times in which we are living the time of perplexity huge challenges 
and uh, uh, if you can because there are some doubts you know like in, in my own classroom or elsewhere also people normally ask question that is there international law does it really matter is it really working is it effective and so logical corollary which people question ask is that sub international law fail ho gaya hai united nations fail ho gaya hai kaam nahi karta hai there is a lot of skepticism day in and day out people have been asking then that lo logically raises the question that does international law matter is international law relevant is it effective and ultimately what is international law what the, what task does it do in the international society and that is one of the most important task because you need to at least no uh, issue rather than trying to find fault with and we need to also be aware that international law basically is a human construct created by human beings is an instrument instrument which is given in the hands of the hands of the sovereign states which will no, naturally use their to their own 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 to further their national interest you know an instrument is an instrument it can be put to good use it can be put to bad use ultimately it's a human 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 nature you know so what i thought was to uh, uh, with the with a little background before i start this you now i had the you know privilege of having a one on one uh, in, interface with the honorable prime minister of india uh, you know basically trying to sensitize and one of the things which we try to touch upon was in the aftermath of the uh, you know surgical strikes by india was what I, what i pleaded for was that to take international law seriously we need to take it seriously basically and i try to spell it out in and one of the requests which you make is that at the heads of state heads of government level at least you want your your prime minister to speak language of international law and i was trying to decipher that does it really make a difference has it really purpose and i i chanced upon i think some friends from the minister of external affairs sent me a small video clip where the, it has been shown you know i'll just it's about 50 seconds i'm sorry that the specific uh, you know uh, 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 that uh, a couple of lines which the prime minister is speaking you know that probably has has been uh, you know muted it's not coming out very clearly but this is available this clip will be available now let me let me try to uh, you know 
to give you little little peep into couple of those this is exactly what normally i'll do with before my class series of those events in different areas ranging from migration to humanitarian crisis to 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 sexual and gender based violence to environmental issues to trade issues to human rights issue you know because people uh, literally they are puzzled you know that where is international law and question is does it really work does it really work what kind of a function in international like we are located in a, as a part of the school of international studies you know that there is a basic underpinnings of the entire area of international relations you know is provided by international law is so so inextricably linked you know that you are you are hardly able to do, to 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 you know differentiate you know between international relations carry the entire conduct of your your foreign affairs you know is interwoven that when the prime minister of india says respect for international law that is exactly what that clip was saying that respect for international law in the foreign minister dr jay shankar alumnus of my my own school uh, has been saying you know commitment to international law india's briefing document before the united nations security council spoke about commitment to international law so when when you have things at the the, the message is that at the highest level heads of state heads of government level when you you reiterate and underscore the very significance of international law it does matter and you will see that series of those events when we will have the uh, you know these these uh, meetings taking place in india under india's presidency in you know, the g20 you will find the 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 heads of government coming here the foreign ministers coming here and speaking their language and through this little ppt i'll try to little take you through 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 that uh, you know uh, you know encapsulate and show that different areas it doesn't just is a pictorial i hope uh, So I think this was the, we had the uh, on second of March the the G20 foreign ministers meeting. I'm just zeroed in on on some of the specific uh, specific uh, paragraph with the prime minister prime minister of India himself saying that we must acknowledge that all multilateralism is in crisis today, and the architecture of the global governance created after the Second World War was to serve two functions: to prevent further wars by balancing the com competing of interests, and second to foster international cooperation on issues of. common interest and the experience of the last few years shows the financial crisis the climate change the pandemic the terrorism and the war clearly showed that the global governance has failed in both its mandate now most interestingly you saw that the on the because of the 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 polarization and the sharp divergence of views on the so far as the ukraine crisis stand off is concerned you know there are different wavelengths from which different people the western bloc is looking at it differently russians have been saying that this is a special special military operation special military operation and india has been taking a, a balanced view although india has been talking about diplomacy and 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 dialogue and saying that well you know respect for international law and here is the because of the lack of consensus in the final you know a consensual statement had not come out so this is the chair summary which explicitly says this is a paragraph 4 uh, of the statement issued by the foreign minister said it is essential to uphold international law and the multilateral system that safeguards peace and stability this includes defending all the purposes and principles enshrined the charter of united nations and adhering to international humanitarian law including protection of civilians and infrastructure in armed conflicts the use or threat of nuclear weapons is inadmissible the peaceful resolution of conflicts efforts to address crises as well as diplomacy and dialogue are vital today's era must not be a war the last line is exactly the words which indian prime minister used you know in his uh, you know there's a conversation with russian president putin and so now this is with india's presidency now this is part of the part of the final communique issued the consensual or is a is a chairs chairs summary you will find it interesting the same paragraph 4 issued by the foreign minister's uh, summary is also you know verbatim taken from the from the g20 finance minister statement the meeting took place in bengaluru on 25th of february you will have the complete identical paragraph paragraph 4 paragraph 4 so that shows the consistent position you know and probably this credit will go to india's presidency the the draftsman although the statement is very long usually g g20 g20 statements you know but the beauty is at least one single paragraph right at the outset you know is exclusively dedicated you know for instrumental you have the reference to the to the to the principles and purposes of united nations the international humanitarian law threat prohibition of threat or use of force article 2 paragraph 4 of the charter of united nations all those elements which will matter they are there as a part of the part of this 
vital vital paragraph you know you have the reference again on the bilateral visits so what i wanted to see was when the heads of state heads of government meet you know you know the question is at that level of confabulations you know do do the issues figure prominently because you will find across the world when these you know, global leaders when they assemble and talk to each other you know you have invariably these issues you know i am saying ki architecture of international law instrument of international law the principle and the purpose of international charter they do do figure in there are people who are very well read well run they have the excellent you know you know draftsmen they have the 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 backup support teams are very good their foreign ministers are very well read so what that you require because here are the issues which are very complex you know you can you have to you have to you know uh, uh, from a from a futuristic gaze you need to address now he is a newly uh, uh, elected german chancellor who came here and again germans have a different view they have been long long standing those this you know differentiation with the russians you know russians and germans russians and french is a old european european you know you know warfare which has been going on so now this is coming out with a full force here is a german chancellor who again talks about you know now they explicitly harp upon aggression word aggression which has a different connotation india has undermined and so very right everybody has accepted that india's vital national interest will require not only energy but other things also so india has been trying to moderate so this is also one of the i would say one of the excellent you know kind of role that you as a moderation role of a moderator not the extremities because life is not about extremities if you can damp, have a have a little dampen like this exactly what the russian foreign minister came and you know urged the indian interlocutor saying that you know the war is going on please come and help us help us to diffuse and resolve the crisis you have the 11th special emergency session of the general assembly on 2nd of march finally the emergency special session and you have the situation the general assembly where where the numerical majority of the of the states you know and the resolution got finally you know adopted by 141 votes in favor seven against 32 abstention which includes china and india and here are the elements where because here the russians don't have the veto power in the security council all resolutions have been blocked but so was the case when we we needed it when we faced the music you know we had the, the entire western world war against us it was russians who stood by india every single vote which was to be taken you know on on issue like kashmir and other russians had vetoed you could imagine the consequences if if that veto was not exercised and this veto was not insert in the charter in the feet of absent mindedness it was done with a purpose it was done with a purpose that in all all situations of collective security you need to have a consensus you know and obviously that these five big powers are again they are they are more equal than the others you know otherwise the charter would not have been would, would not have been accepted you know that every big power will try to do it you know i will not go into the greater list. but here are the issues where explicit issue about, about the sovereignty independence unity and territorial integrity of ukraine it deplores article 2 paragraph 4 one of the cardinal principles of prohibition of threat or use of force has been articulated by the general assembly what i am indicating is there are many areas where future research people will be this exactly what we need to embark upon we need to put that in the scanner saying that does it really matter the context in which this resolution and most importantly the legal character of the resolutions of the general assembly this has been a old debate you know because these resolutions are recommendatory is there any recommended resolution which has a legal effect that any student of international law shall have to really my 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 take will be that general assembly is the plenary organ is a is a is a is a conductor of a grand orchestra numerical majority political organ of united nations so many of the resolutions although they are recommendatory will have a substantial amount of normative character substantial amount of normative character you know not all resolutions can be dismissed like recommendatory you know because it all depends who makes the recommendations you know and so this is a very i will not have the time to again go into that but the very important thing where general assembly has banked upon the 1950 resolution called uniting for peace resolution during the korean crisis so this is the 11th emergency special session and many people have not noticed what they have tried to do the resolution which the general assembly has adopted after the consistent veto which was used by the russians you know in the ukraine crisis because people 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 have ignored that part what the resolution says is you know what i call is the blunting the uh, blunting the edges of veto exercise of veto that as and when any particular permanent member of the security council uses the veto within 10 days 
you know, the General Assembly will convene the emergency special session and the veto wielding, veto exercising the, the, the power which use the veto shall have to come to the General Assembly and explain the veto. The very fact that you are asking the, the, the use of veto, power which uses the veto to come and explain that itself is a huge dampening effect. That itself is a huge dampening effect. The very fact that probably many people have, again, what I notice, you know, many people have not even paid attention. You have a, for the first time a use of force which invokes the Charter of United Nations. We also did it. When we used the, uh, you know, surgical strike under only under right of self-defense, Article 51. Because no other provision allows us. We did the same thing. Russians have done it. This is special military operation, Article 51. Right of self-defense. Most importantly, Russian president, the statement was immediately provided to the UN Security Council. Immediately. Every single communication, if somebody does not want to see, you know, somebody has a problem about noticing the actual working of international law, here is the actual working. Every single military operation taking place, both on the sides of Russians and the Ukrainians, is reported to the Security Council. The only thing is, the Security Council cannot take action. Security Council cannot take action because of the veto power. But the very fact, this is the, where the beauty and majesty of the working of international law takes place, that you report any shelling of, of a fuel depot or any, any school or hospital or church, you know, immediately is reported. Russians also report and Ukrainians report. The very fact that you go to the, that peace enforcement organ of United Nations, you know, what else will you require? You know? And the discussion takes place in the Security Council, except one presidential statement, no particular peace enforcement resolution is adopted by, could be adopted by the Security Council. And this is exactly what the, what the as a permanent member of the Security Council has the strength because of the very inherent nature of the power they have. Now here is something, again probably you must have seen, I am just flagging things, you know, people, if you read day in and day out in the newspaper, here are the issues which will, which will inextricably have, you know, those elements of international law, tell, tell, evidence. If people say, where is international law, here is international law. Russian president again addressed after the, on the one, first anniversary of the, of the Ukraine operation and when he says, West started the war and we are using the force to end. So it's like a smart lawyer, you know. Like they, they say, the glass is half empty, glass is half full. Both sides, you know, have the have the story to tell. Who will decide? The time will decide. Who is right? Who is not right? You know. And I think uh, so. Russians have been saying that we have been pushed in the corner, and this is exactly what the right of self-defense is about. When a state's existence is at threat, you know, if you if you go back to the time of the legality of the threat or use of nuclear weapons case, the advisory opinion given by the International Court of Justice, this is exactly what the court said. You know, that Ashwatthama is Ashwatthama Hato, Norova Kunjarova. Ashwatthama is killed. I don't know whether it, it was the human being or the elephant. Half truth, you know. So the truth lies somewhere, you know. And in, in a sense, you know, that you will you will you will try to try to try to use your whatever the whatever the capacity which is available to defend your right of self-defense. Even the International Court of Justice said in the legality of threat or use of nuclear weapons that if a survival of a state is at stake and if a state uses nuclear weapon, whether that will be legal or illegal, they say we don't know. It's like a famous Yudhisthir story. They say, sub, I don't know. You go and you make the law and come back to us. Means the very survival is stake. It's the right of self-defense in a, in, a, in a municipal system also. If somebody is posing a threat to you, you have the right to Right to use force, any amount, just to survive. Either you kill, like in the army, either you kill somebody or somebody kills you. So survival is at the stake and this is exactly what the, is an integral part of the architecture of international law. The global humanitarian crisis is one of the biggest crises the world faces. Like the, on, on 20th of February, the UN, UN relief, uh, you know, chief, you know, Martin Griffiths went, you know, in, a, in, in this meeting in Riyadh, you know, said that the humanitarian needs you know, span across the world and there you have the largest food crisis in the modern history. Largest food crisis in the modern history. 350 million people are really starving. And un un unprecedented amount of more than 54 billion dollars worth aid that you require and the money is nowhere available. People are dying, people are hungry, starvation, conflicts are taking place. It is, it is going to upset the entire apple cart. One of the biggest worry in the UN United Nations headquarters is what will happen to the your sustainable development goals? All parameters have been thrown to the winds. 
completely you know it's it will be turned to be topsy turvy and these are the three things with the with the with the you know un relief commissioner has has zero in one old wars don't end as new ones start like the democratic republic of congo for decades together congo is a turf war more than 70 17500 un peacekeepers are, st are are stationed in congo even un peacekeepers themselves are being attacked look at the crisis we ought to know i have written on that part that when the humanitarian themselves are under attack what do you do and who becomes a sacrificial lamb who are the cannon fodder the indians pakistanis bangladeshis nepalis sri lankans because the life of value of life in this part of the world is very 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 low is they provide the peacekeepers i think of, often we have the dead bodies coming coming here indian peacekeepers have been attacked like in a un compound the rebel groups launch the attack so what i'm talking about is you have a, one of the biggest how do you reign in the those warring groups how do you reign in the people and many of the countries you know the resources have become the curse and i suggest to you if somebody has the interest please uh, you know uh, you know listen to the speech given by De dennis mukwes the recipient of the 2018 nobel peace prize he said my 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 country is among the among the most wealthiest country in the world but it's among the most poor our resources have become our curse warring groups rebel groups diamond mines gold cobalt nickel the multinational corporations they are playing the proxy wars the entire african continent you can if you can see the, the the conflicts are raging and who will stop them now you put the blame on united nations you put you find fault with international law what can international law do international law cannot penetrate into the minds of the people like if you look at the preamble to the constitution of unesco it says the seeds of war lie in the minds of men and by building the defense of peace will be able to usher in the in a, in a new world the charter of united nations says the score jido yuddh ko abhishap kaha gaya hai it's a appalling evil then why do people fight you have a huge amount and then you assemble here where you ask people to donate donate money and money is not available people are starving and we saw that both in our neighboring countries when there is a stand off in afghanistan you know when taliban simply you know storm to power there you know in utter defiance of all international norms you, you couldn't do anything you couldn't do it all diplomatic missions you know they had to run away india had to abandon our own own those billions of dollars for projects there we couldn't send the relief material we decided to give 50000 tons of wheat to afghanis and the and the you have the you have to cross the pakistani border we we gave it to the world food program the convoys are not going look at the part look at the problems and if it falls into the hands of the rebels again you have no no control we send some 20000 tons of rice to 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 sri lanka for instance when the people were starving so look at the world in which we live you know when you have a huge crisis on your hand you know there is no time for ideological warfare you know there is no kind you no know, kind of a you know writing in those those glossy things you know in a very very difficult to to understand language you know highly complicated english you know language when you write those thing you need to have a what my my plea will be solution oriented thing the world needs solutions world needs ideas because there are human beings involved not only human beings your environment wildlife nature everything the very very survival it will be at stake you know you have other issue which came up probably i don't know how many of you notice this when the united in the united states you know senate passed a bi bipartisan resolution and you know recognizing arunachal pradesh as a part of india because we still have a problem with the chinese whenever the indian prime minister or the president of india visits arunachal pradesh chinese protest they say this is a disputed territory so when you talk about here here is the issue of recognition visits of heads of state heads of government or you know endorsement from a like the most important part is the us recognition of the mcmahon line which is during the colonial period obviously we have the issues there but once you recognize the mcmahon line many of these issues you know will be resolved you know i think so this is a very very important uh, milestone i think this will require more more scrutiny i am saying that here is one of the most important you know instrumentally of international law you know recognition recognition or providing sanctity when when the states will uh, accept you know those disputed territories you know which are part and parcel of those things you, know. you have another facet which probably you must have seen many of the people have been fascinated but have not attracted much attention is this transcontinental translocation of animals look at that part if somebody says there is no hope here is the hope that the, this animals very beautiful animals creatures they become extinct 
you being you know you, you see the hear the stories there's entire jumbo jumbo carrier you know brings the those crates of cheetahs initially eight then followed by 12 from a completely different habitat from namibia and south africa some 20 cheetahs have been released in the madhya pradesh kuno national park you know and how much planning you know everything and you have the bilateral agreement so probably what we will require is again little push giving a push to strengthening of the international wildlife law you need to because why the species become extinct because there is a trade huge thriving trade the tiger elephants you know or rhinos for instance they get killed it's a multi billion dollar business you need to see see to be believed you know the kind of the pictures which are available or like what people call in many of the african place called the blood diamonds blood diamonds you wear this you know those those things you know, which are the basically from the skins of the animals they you carry the blood of animals on your on your body in the fashion parlors of of, of europe and elsewhere so one of the most important here are the issues which we need to really place them under scanner if the lawyers have to play the role if the scholars have to play the role here are the issues where you need to come out with those things that what do you do how will you do it how will you make this international law this different facets of it time will not permit to go into those different areas but i'm just flagging the broad area you need to fill up the lacuna fill up the gaps you know there is another crisis on our hand the sea level crisis global sea level crisis they say the 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 sea level is actually rising and the impact of the rising sea is already creating new sources of instability and conflicts large part of it as probably we have seen in india's coastal areas where the flood waters are really really you know gushing in and absorbing entire communities you know you have the vanishing coastlines endangered nations forced migration competition over natural resources many of the island nations are afraid that they might be submerged completely submerged like like maldives or like sri lanka or even even in so many many parts of india's coastal areas they say because the because of the rising temperatures you know the seas expand the sea level they rise and this is the highly unprecedented the w wmo figures they show that the global average sea levels have risen faster since 19, 1900 than any time in the preceding century in the last 3000 years if somebody says the tell tell effects of that you know uh, global warming and the rising sea level you know that the scientifically it's being shown that in last 3000 years what you have noticed because it's happening at a particular level which will be unbelievable it has a huge kind of a consequences and the global oceans have warmed faster than the past century than any time in last 11000 years the, the the oceans are getting warmer and warmer and you can imagine the consequences once they become warmer and warmer what will happen to the entire you know lives you know which are there the, the fish and the all the all the creatures which are there what will happen to it you have lot of lot of whales you know coming to the coastline you no know, you know completely you know you know they get suffocated there are many 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 coastlines where you find the dozens of whales or sharks coming and simply simply you know getting suffocated and simply dying on your coastline if you if you imagine a situation if that happens here all marine life coming to the shore you know they get because they become breathless plenty of plastic is there by year 2050 if if you do not change your ways there will be more plastic in the oceans than even fish all your land based sources of pollution getting dumped into the ocean so here are the real thing that is exactly why and especially when we talk about the blue economy and then prime minister has harped upon the blue economy if india has the stakes you know and there are other challenges i have not mentioned about the maritime piracy indian parliament has just passed the law on on combating maritime piracy indian navy and coast guard will be there so there is other threat you know in the when you talk about the blue economy you have the again the 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 operation dost which india has been doing that now people say what what it requires basically is a committee of nations international cooperation friendly relation within no time within no time you can see the empathy immediately and if you see the you know the pictures and the those movie accounts the indian air force flight carries those 99 member indian team member led by you know including major bina tiwari you know who set up 8 hours they travel they go through the arabian sea because you can't you know or fly the pakistani territory 8 hours flight then further 5 hours of road travel setting up the hospital you don't sleep for 2 3 nights and immediately the hospital must start working look at the relief and you have to you don't know the territory you don't know the people and still you just bring out the 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 the, the bodies you know from that wreckage you carry the machines and everything you carry with you look at that part you know huge agentic of within no time you respond to these things you know and here is the turkey turkey syria more than 42000 people got killed 
this called one of the example of, of nature's fury and here is the example where where you need the tightening or working on what what i would call it the you know international disaster law international disaster law what will you do with these ecological upheavals you know I, in fact I, I wrote one of the piece you know almost at the outset of my career you know and uh, if somebody is interested it's available in the in the social science and medicine journal on managing ecological upheavals you know which sought to mention you know for instance called for the comprehensive global convention on mass disaster encompassing sharing of data transfer of disaster management technology developing countries you know uh, uh, to the developing that is the need of the earth so this entire disaster law both man made and human because these things are going to grow earthquakes tsunamis you know you pandemics huge amount of things international health law again needs to be revitalized i'm just flagging the the, the nature of the challenges which you face you know and there is a huge room for the scholarship international law scholarship to contribute to those things additional contributions you know aapke paas jhagda karne ka time hi nahi rehna chahiye there is enough time you know enough time more than any any multiple lifetimes you can spend to address these issues you know and i would say from the rostrum of this india society international law i will urge everybody to 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 come together you know and apply that this is a very constructive creative is a humanitarian work you know if you cannot do justice to that instrument or international law we will be really failing in our duty you know you have the again issue i just flag it i will not go in female genital mutilation more than 200 girls and women have been subjected to fgm throughout the world more than 4.3 million girls and women will be subjected to fgm in 2023 alone 2023 alone these are the united nations figures they talk about elimination of fgm we have published a, a full article if somebody wants in india journal of international law society's flagship journal in 2020 on elimination of female genital mutilation making international human rights law work please take a look at that part how much is the kind of the appalling crisis we have and the domestic implication we have a case sunita tiwari's case pending before the nine judge constitution bench of the supreme court of india nine judge constitution bench we don't know when that will come up for the hearing but here is a issue you have a real issues you know and they say where for all non medical purpose more than half of the united states state you know, those you know constitution units have prohibited the fgm european countries have prohibited prohibited african countries have started prohibiting look at the things the question is this instrumentality the entire framework on which you work you know is international human rights work law you have about a, about a half a dozen special reporters of the human rights council you know which have been really concerned about it on 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 violence against women there is a you know un special envoy secretary general special envoy pamela patton she is looking at the at the at the at the violence in conflict zones look at the what i am mentioning is look at the activism look at the engagement look at the resources involved so please don't be dismissive ki sab un kuch nahi karta hai khatam ho gaya hai fail ho gaya hai wo kya karta hai theek hai wo gossip mein chal sakta hai you don't know the kind of the nature of the people involved the kind of the pain and the suffering the kind of the risk people face i've written out something on the on the risk with the humanitarians face you go in that firing zone you go in the where the where your lives are at risk you don't know whether you will come back alive or not in fact i had a chance to talk to the former pre president who had just demitted office dr peter morer for years on a, on a skype talk or and i told him i said how do you muster up the courage to move from haiti to 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 yemen to sudan to ukraine you know and he said at the end of the day i am really convinced i i really hope against hope that these forces which engage in death and destruction mayhem and killing the people and causing they say they are not invincible they are not invincible so what do you do how do you do hope against hope there are death and destruction when there are people are wailing starving there is nothing there is completely ghost town hai so huge amount of things are there where where you need to address it is another issue which again became a bone of contention you know like bangladesh foreign minister on a visit to sri lanka ran into the pakistani foreign minister and asking for the accounts koi kehta na sabki ho gaya ho gaya bhul gaye you know it's a past is past this is exactly where the past will haunt you it doesn't leave your track he said ki you owe an apology to us and, and pakistani foreign minister she said we have our compulsions because she knows ki if she cannot even go home if she tenders an apology but you have to account for it here is a here is a monument prepared by the people you know on the outskirts of dhaka mujib nagar showing the more than 200000 to 400000 bangladeshi women were raped in the last final days of when the when the when the when the pakistani army surrendered when they surrendered still because they thought they will hit where it hurts you most the sexual and gender based violence they thought the you know, rape is cheaper than the bullets and that is where most of the conflict zones rape has become the norm 
because it hurts you. It's a naming and shaming. And most of the things, you know, is not even raised before any of the criminal tribunals also. And this is one of the most important issues which has to be yet to be cracked. You know, one of the, and I, as I said, 2018 Nobel Peace Prize to Nadia Murad and Denis Mukwes was exactly to, to focus upon this kind of a inhuman, most, most, most atrocious kind of a shame that we have. Other issue which I'll quickly wind up, you know, is like a lot of people have been talking about the Indus Water Treaty. We know 60, 60 years have been over. I just wrote a piece on environmental policy and law. 60 years of the Indus Water Treaty, you know, in the era of climate change. A look ahead in the hydro diplomacy and treaty law. Now, there has been, because you know, this is a unique treaty where, where World Bank is sitting there and there is a receding flow in the, in the, all the tributaries of Indus. I was a coordinator of an inter-university consortium, four universities, Sikkim, Kashmir, Jammu and JNU, with 18 crore rupees given by Department of Science and Technology. It's a, a sin to be believed how much, you know, the shrinking of the Himalayan glacier is going to pose a threat in the years to come. The water, water flow will, will, will be receding. So, if the water itself is less, what will you share with, with, the, with them, you know? And we have been talking, the Indian Prime Minister has been talking, that blood and water cannot go together. Or some people have been saying, that turning of the tap. You can't turn up, you can't, you know, switch off Satlaj river. But, the, and you have not been able to use the water. Most of the water goes, you know, into the Arabian Sea. Now, finally, what I wrote in 2021, saying that, you know, it will require India to take the lead from the front to bring the review of the 1960 IWT, especially in the light of the climatic changes, to the negotiation table at an appropriate time. For the timing, it needs to be celebrated that IWT has stood the test of time for six long decades. It will necessitate a common understanding and sagacity among the Indus Basin riparian states for the future betterment of the common hydrological resources in the interest of the teeming millions of citizens. And ultimately, we did serve them the notice, finally. Now, under what provision, whether that will matter, whether it's a, is it a fundamental change of circumstance, which will require, because the Indus water, the IWT does not provide for withdrawal. There is no provision for withdrawal. In the change circumstances, on the ground that the glacials are melting, the river, the, the water supply in the Indus all the rivers, you know, is you know declining, and but and also interestingly, as as this uh, this this uh, article itself uh, spells out, you know, it was some time ago. Even Pakistani Senate also passed a resolution saying that we need to have a revision of the Indus Water Treaty because it's a very complicated issue. Each time India is being dragged to the things. My you know our former you know uh, student, you know Luther Rangreji, he is the joint secretary he, he can tell more about it, how much it cost us whenever we are we are we are dragged to an arbitration kishan ganga arbitration you know millions of dollars you end up end up paying you know to the you know permanent court of arbitration for it for any any trivial issue pakistan you know wrecks up the issue and so the question is you know it it enhances the cost and we don't have the bilateral relations at that level where you can sit across and come out assessment of the common hydrological cycle it will require maybe we don't know how much time it but probably hum bade hain we are bigger ones. We are. We we have. It's a. This a treaty itself is a sign of India's magnanimity towards Pakistan. We were very generous. जो बड़ा है वो तो वही तो generous होता है. छोटा दिल और छोटी सोच से कभी कोई कभी दुनिया कभी नहीं बनती है. You know, nobody has been able to. This is what uh, former Prime Minister Atal Bihari Vajpayee said. That with a small heart you cannot become great, and with a small mind you cannot be standing 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 tall. You know. So again, it's the onus is on us, and probably since we already fired the salvo, let let us see whether Pakistan comes around and what response they give, so far as the revision of the treaty is concerned. Grave threat to international peace and security, I'll quickly, again, this was January 2022, UN Deputy Secretary Amina Mohammed you know, she went and said, this is one of the biggest issues, the grave threat, plenty of resolutions I'll suggest to you. Please take a look at the resolution of General Assembly. They run into something more than 300. Each of them are very painstakingly designed, even if they are recommended in nature. Look at the churning which is going on. Somebody thinks about it. Somebody worries about it. Somebody works hard. Somebody lobbies for it. You know. And again, for the General Assembly itself does. And here is an example which again, the UN General Assembly, you know, gave the, took the initiative to refer the issue concerning the, you know, occupied Palestinian territory to the advisory opinion of the International Court of Justice. Although we know that its advisory opinions are advisory. In 2004 also, the International Court of Justice gave the advisory opinion and Israel simply sat over it. But Israeli Supreme Court also said this is a violation of international law. So what will be of impact is the whether the we need to take a call, whether the case case study or the scenario which prevails in the occupied Palestinian territory, you know, because we also have our own own area under Pakistani occupation. It's called Pakistan occupied Kashmir. The law of occupation, the whole law of belligerent occupation will be at stake, you know. 
and it remains to be seen whether we take a stand because we have to do the homework again the same thing will apply and the the advisory opinion given by the international court of justice will have a thing again the un signal I, I i compare him in a, one of the recent things which i wrote last week you know saying that the plight of the un signal is akin to a, a to a lonely house sparrow when her forest was on 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 fire you know she was running from pillar to post asking everybody to to save the forest you can listen to his speeches everywhere because he is a politician the former prime minister of portugal he has a political stature so he has the capacity to shout sometimes you shout you complain you speak you know you remember you speak and you 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 know you, you bring the issue to the forefront if you too much you shout people somebody will somebody will give attention to you and he is the chief executive officer of united nations you know and he says you know plenty of things you know like burkina faso again abduction of women and girls look at those warring groups you know boko haram and is and plenty of them the plight of the women and girls who live in those conflict zones is un unbelievable mass abduction of the girls and women still you as if you know it's a medieval you know period where where you know they were used you know still they say they are used as a bushwives most of the warring groups they use them as bushwives like what the japanese did in the second world war they are they they set up a comfort stations you know with the with the, the with the girls and women who were taken you know from the indo china for instance you know that made the japanese very unpopular very unpopular people still don't trust here is the example where you know the, you look at imagine the life of the people there you know for instance the other issue like the world energy transition probably we are waiting waiting with a gas you know gasping for the fresh breath where how will that happen we have to move away from the fossil fuel economy which is one of the most polluting cancer causing and huge cost for a country like india thankfully since we have the excellent relation with the russians you know and we have got the cheaper oil we have got the rupee ruble trade etc our economy has survived our economy could at least weather this storm without the russians that cheaper oil our we would have been devastated but the question is in the sooner or you know later we have to move away from the fossil fuels the time has has already come whether we go for the solar we go for the hydro we go for whatever the other other renewable source of energy wind power geothermal that we have to find each one shall have to find the resources to you need energy and the question is how far will do we already india has mooted that or body called international solar alliance already set up in gurugram but i'm told that the most of the money india india herself has invested most of the member countries have not so we have to probably take a call the estimate is by by year 2050 more than 90% of the global energy could be from the renewable sources that itself will be thing but we have to move away you know don't need to open new refineries you don't need to have the new oil wells you know you have to move and that will take a huge political cost like what the germans did they switched off most of the nuclear power plants moved away took a political decision by the when the green party came to power green party was one of the critical alliance partner all nuclear power stations stopped french france is doing it their huge component they have encourage every single home to go for geothermal can we do it like we already have the now the, in the most of the urban cities about the solar 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 you know panels and other things you know so we shall have to move that we shall have to walk the talk okay but we have need to have the policy legal instrument institutional architecture to have that huge i would say you know historic energy transition which the 21st century will call for without that you know we are going to be having a in a in a, in a unbelievable kind of a kind of a crisis you know. this is something a, a book which came out, i that we need to again know as to what goes into the things you know when actually we celebrate the writing of the judgments of the international courts and tribunals you know what called the everyday makers of international law this probably i thought i'll flag if somebody has the interest you can pick up this you know somewhere from the from the literature you know or women fighting for the rights again under the this why i'm talking talk about 31st of december when the world came the, the year came to an end around the world half of the global population facing facing that kind of unprecedented kind of a crisis you know ranging from afghanistan to 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 african countries or even many of the other countries you know one of the most most vulnerable you know and you have your own examples you know where you know uh, they are the, like the even a woman also bear the bear the consequences of the climate change you know the violence during the pandemic un, un, unbelievable amount of you know kind of the violence took place you know they say both the perpetrators and the victims were confined to the same place you know violence has really spiked during the entire pandemic period you know and they say one in three women one in three women globally have been subjected to sexual violence once in their lifetime look at the figure 
un, 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 unprecedented amount of violence which take place and we know it very well. What happens in the heart of the capital of India? We have the law, we have the stringent penalty, the, de de the death penalty. It doesn't deter the, it doesn't deter any, any, any of them. So, mere existence of a law that per se, so, koi kata hai, international law kya karta hai, international law kya karta hai. International law cannot go and catch hold of the people, cannot go into the minds of the people. Harshest penalty thing. Again, that is exactly why you need the mindset, attitudes. That is exactly what the education, role of the education is there. You must hope against hope. You must believe in something. You must remain engaged. And that is exactly the story, you know. You find the changes are coming around. Large number of the areas where the changes are coming around. Here, femicide, country like Mexico and Brazil, large number of women being gunned down, killed. Figures are unbelievable. They say, you go, you come out of the home, you don't know whether you return, return or not. Simply gun down. There is so much hatred, so much venom. Societal structures are such where there is complete insecurity. The figures are again not, 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 you know, they say more than 1000 cases of femicide last year, you know, in Mexico. 1000 women gunned down. Simply. Mexico, Brazil, Latin American countries, you know. So, femicide is, has emerged as one of the biggest issues. You have the issue like global migration. It's only, I have seen the, seen the United States Mexico border, seen to be believed, how the people simply want to flee, to simply want to run away. It's a, the entire, entire fence is electrified, and yet you are not deterred. By somehow you want to do it. I'll just find out. You have the, you have the plenty of the more than 2.2 million people, migrants, you know, they face encounters during 2021 and September 2020. 2.2 million migrants, you know, who simply want to get out. Sheer desperation. I don't want to go in the stories of how the entire Mediterranean Sea has become the ground, you know, where boats are sunk by the Italian Coast Guard, periodically. Large number of people from Punjab, Gujarat, Kerala, youth, you know, they are lured by the people. Our Gujarati mein kahawat hai, Hindi mein bhi hai, ki jahan lalchi log hote hai, maha dhokhe baad log bukhe nahi marte hai. If, if, if though there are people who are greedy, the cheaters will not go hungry. And that is the example. Because your society is such. Kaha jana hai? Foreign jana hai. Minimum LLM with, of a foreign degree will be required. Foreign. F capital. If that is not a case of colonialism, what else it is? What is foreign? We are so crazy about the foreign. So you are paying the price. People simply run away. People simply want to run away from that risk zones, you know. You have Afghanistan, I don't want to again mention much, all women have been put behind the veils, you know, completely within with the stroke of Taliban coming to power. And all the crimes committed you know, by Taliban have gone unaccountable. When Taliban came to power, a lot of some of the veteran Indian diplomats, you know, who are very practical, kafi samajdar log hai, retire hone ke baad lagta hai ki kaha dal galegi, wo hume nikalna hai. They said, Sab, let us recognize, let us with Taliban, let us talk to them. How can you talk to a renegade element which has committed those unbelievable crimes, you know? You need to close the chapter. You must hold them accountable. And you saw government of India put, put it on hold. We will talk to them, not, not have any truck with the Taliban. They have to account for it. And all the things. And United Nations cannot do anything. The secretary is pleading. The special envoys are pleading, saying that you allow them to come out of home. Let them have a f breathe fresh air. Education, forget about it. Employment, forget about it. You are talking about a like a medieval times, for instance, you know. And this is one of the biggest things. Where Americans were part for 20 years in Afghanistan. They buy, bought their way out, you know, all for 20 years. And suddenly you vanished. You had a bilateral agreement with the Taliban, so-called Amirat of Taliban, Islamic Amirat of Taliban, and you ran away, simply. A superpower runs into an agreement with a non-state actor. Unbelievable thing. For their own interest, they came for their own interest, ran away for their own interest. And Taliban is now has become law unto itself. Question is, how will you reign in Taliban? What will you do? That is one of the biggest challenges that you that you will face. You have the scores of terrorism, as you saw, as our our term to the Security Council came to an end. The the, the Indian Foreign Minister personally went to went to New York, chaired a session on 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 15th of December. You know, and uh, this was basically you know about uh, you know the 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 acts of terrorism where Indian sponsored resolution, UN Security Council resolution 2664, 9th of December. That you need to at least it will be worth reading. You know, where. India, this is exactly where our leadership could be there, but there, people don't share your wavelength. When we wanted, you know, India wanted, Indian foreign minister wanted in the draft, when the statement came out, you know, we wanted the terrorism to be considered as an existential threat. Or oh, everybody disagreed with India. 
resolution was adopted by 14 to 0. The irony was since President of the UN Security Council has mooted the resolution. Now you can't vote against your own resolution. You can't vote against it. So we had to abstain. So 14 to 1. Look at it. This really calls for your, your, your leadership, you know. Okay? You need to really do the soul searching. And people wanted it to be one of the most serious threat to international peace and security. Full stop. That's it. It's not there. Of course, they say more than more than 8,000 terrorist activities, lakhs of, but they say, well, it's one of the threats. For us, we call it existential threat. So completely from a, so you have a different perception in a, in a global order where terrorism, you know, really is rampant. You have, so question is, how will you articulate? And so we need to keep engaged, stay engaged and talk about that part saying that again, you cannot have selectivity when acts of terrorism are there. This is exactly what the Americans did not listen to you till the 9-11 came up, you know. Once it hit them, they thought, yes, it is a real challenge. So you have to, I think, show them. But at least it was probably fruitful. We could have really pushed the envelope when, during the presidential presidential uh, this uh, membership of the Security Council. But now we shall have to wait for I think maybe next ten years when again India shall have a chance to chance to be a non permanent member of the Security Council because the permanent membership you know is still illusory. We don't know. I don't think uh, any any in a foreseeable future you will have that. And I don't think uh, you know uh, we'll have other 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 things coming out. Uh, planetary crisis again. This uh, the whole global environmental crisis is heading to a situation when you are saying that moving from a common concern to a planetary concern at a planetary level kind of a crisis. Which every single part of the world you are facing that crisis. And this was the COP 15 meeting of the biodiversity in December, where you can look at the look at the harmful subsidies which might come under scanner. You have 30 percent of world's lands, oceans, coastal areas, and inland waters. You know which need protection. So your human, human habitation, human, you know, use itself has become one of the menace, you know. So these are the things which we need to really uh, prepare the things which require a phenomenal cost. I have not included the desertification where India wants 30 million hectares of land to be reclaimed, you know, out of it, you know. Look at the nature of the challenge, biodiversity, desertification and here is the climate change. If somebody wants to read my, my, my preface, you know, it's environmental policy and law, the issue has just come out, issue number 5 on 6 in December. Oh, almost a dozen articles, you know, will come out with the special, including by, by Daniel Bodensky, you know, on what I call as the climate change conundrum, where the most serious part is most of the developing countries have what is called, popularly called, backtracking from their commitments. The agreement is there. What will you do with the agreement? You don't care. Money, money is elusive. So we are running that. And I really, I, re I remember fondly, you know, uh, you know, one of the very finest, uh, you know, Indian diplomats, you know, who is no more. Only uh, day before yesterday, he passed away. Chandrasekhar Dasgupta, you know. I really uh, you know, fondly remember my association with, I used to be part of the India's official delegation to multi, all multi, multiple kinds of negotiations, especially on climate negotiations. He was one of the pioneers, you know, when this whole principle of common but differential responsibility was mooted. He was the most articulate, you know, ace negotiator from Indian side, you know. So, when we know it, when we do the homework, when you know the intricacies of international law and do the homework, it works wonders when India takes the leadership. But you need the homework, you need the clarity. And who will do the research? Who will do the homework? That is one of the biggest challenges. So, I think this is exactly and probably we are heading toward a situation, you know, where, you know, yeah, the, 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 many of the people are not aware that the General Assembly has passed a resolution calling for a, for a summit of the future. On 22nd and 23rd of September 2024. So it's one and a half years, countdown has started. What lies in the future, we don't know. India shall have to take the lead so far as the preparation is concerned. I'm already engaged into calling for uh, ideational contributions from the around the world. Almost. And people have provided me something 55 ideational contributions in last two years. 55 ideational contributions from all parts of the world. Two books have come out, the third is in the pipeline. International climate change law, probably in the next couple of months it will come out. You know. So, what I am saying is from a scholarly domain, you need to remain engaged. It is ideational better. It is not necessary that you need to be sitting in Harvard, Harvard, MIT, or, or Stanford. It is doable, it is possible. We need to take it to that level. You know. So, I am sure you know this, this is going to be the kind of the new challenge, new orientation, again multilateralism, where India took the things on 14th of December. Again, Pakistan occupied Kashmir issue, which uh, Organization of Islamic Conference, when the Secretary General visited, we protested. Again, this is the flip side where we always protest about the legal character or sovereignty of a particular territory. And we, we lambasted, I think, 
external affairs spokesman said that any attempt to interfere in meddling in India's internal affairs, you know. So these are the issues. When somebody visits your area which is disputed, you really, you know, shout at them. So this is again a very integral, consistent practice, you know, where uh, you don't want any acquiescence, principle of acquiescence to be, to be applied and this will be very important. Gender parity for equality, again, United Nations system is buzzing with the whole idea where more and more women representation throughout, they say almost they reach the, you know, in the higher echelons of the United Nations, you know, where the, you know, they say it's vital to, for the United Nations to, to, to have it, you know, and there's a global shift in the recognition when many of the countries, you know, in 1945, San Francisco conference did not even allow women to vote. Just, we have started from 1945 when all those 51 delegations present in San Francisco, that, that opera house in San Francisco, the country member delegations did not allow women members to even vote for their country. And now we are here, you know, year 2023, you know, in the beginning, where, you know, you have almost heads of state, heads of government, you know, members of parliament. Now, the latest figures show that every single country which boasts of a parliament, now there are women members of parliament. We have reached to that level. Global gender gap is one of the biggest issues. You know, I'll, 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 you know, urge people to take a look at 2022 global gender gap. It's again an unbelievable kind of a one half of the population. You don't consider to, them to be even the equal. That is one of the biggest challenge. I would say for, for international law. Advent of the new technology, I will not go into the, here is the Punjab sector, where again you have the drone, menace of drones coming out and you shoot it down, carrying a lot of narcotics, it's a hidden war going on against you. The question is, what will you do? How will you regulate the new technology, which is really sweeping the whole area? You don't need the physical weapons, you know, you have the things for each time, how the, how the border security force, you know, and you have the narcotics weapons coming out. So that is again, you don't need, you don't see the enemy and the things are coming. So we face, I think Punjab border has become really a problematic where you need to really find innovative solutions. We do it. Obviously, we are trying, but the very nature of the problem is such that you need to really rise to the occasion. And finally, you saw that is this picture, you know, from my own home state, my very, very, very near to my own, own, own place you know, where this family of four people, they came, they were, there are, as I said, you know, where lalchi log hote hain, each of them, they were brought here, they were trafficked. Delhi is the hub, people are brought to Delhi, taken to Calcutta and from there, you know, taken to long flights to Canada and from Canada, Canada side, they are pushed into the American border. This family of four were frozen to death in minus 39 degrees temperature on, on January 19, 2022. And that shows, you know, no reversion was caused. Kisi ke pet ka pani nahi hila, pure mulk mein. Kisi ko nahi laga, sab, we must stop it. Canadian government woke up, they said nothing doing, never ever will allow anybody to die on our borders. And they're all from a, they're not from a very ordinary, they're all comfortable family. They have a huge three, three story mansion, lot of agricultural land. So why do people migrate? Why do people leave? Punjab mein jo hota hai, har ghar mein upar panchi lagaya hua hai. Ke puttar, puttar vaha hai. Puttar kya karta? Hitro airport par jhadu maarta hai. Puttar taxi chalata hai. That is a matter of, matter of pride for you. So we need to at least do the soul searching. Why do you run away? Why do you run away? And I think this is a, again a very, very, very big issue. I will not go into that. And uh, trafficking is one of the most important issues. You have a United Nations Convention against Transnational Organized Crime. So here is the convention I thought I will bring to it. So just to wind up, I just provide you a little, little peep into this pictorial uh, 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 kind of a developments which have been taking place, some about 30, 30 issues which I thought and I thought this is the right occasion when plenty of people who presented their those research things and questions. I'm sure this is literally, uh, I would say, food for thought and on the premise of the Indian Society of International Law and I hope and pray that well, many of you who come from different parts of India, you know, hopefully you will take a cue at least with a, at, at least with a, with a, with a, that kind of a belief that here is a, here is an instrumentality of international law which primarily, you know, which will further a state's interest, the instrumented work. So the question is, if you have howsoever perfect or, or genuine uh, instrument or a system is, if you have the dishonest intention, you can't blame the instrument, you can't blame the system. Who doesn't let international law work? It's a human beings, people themselves. So you need to educate them, you need to really prevail upon them. You need to ensure that that, that issue, you know, that what, what leads to warfare, what leads to conflicts, what leads to this entire atrocities, the exploitation of the human being, human beings by human beings, migration, trafficking, violence. 
and every society shall have to find the things. International law can only reflect upon it. So, what I will appeal for, you know, it requires a hardcore research in all those areas of international law. It's a, it's a huge challenge, I am sure, uh, probably, you know, what I call as the taking international law seriously. And uh, uh, I hope and pray that most of the, those, uh, you know, law schools, which uh, India has a mushrooming growth of the law schools, you know, apart from teaching, you know, apart from prioritizing that teaching, you know, at least you leave some scope, you know, which will help India to resolve our own problems, so legal problems and India which wants, you know, jo ki, you know, we want to be a Vishwa Guru, we want to be sitting on the global high table and you need the ideas, you need the solutions, you need that cutting edge research. I hope that people uh, here, you know, and uh, especially, you know, uh, 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 since, in, you know, ISL has the one of the biggest library in the international law, uh, uh, the things will percolate down, it will inspire a lot of people and I, I hope and pray that uh, things will take a better shape for the future. Thank you. Many thanks, sir, for uh, such a detailed, insightful, and lively presentation. Now, I request Professor Anupam Jha, sir, to kindly give the uh, address to the gathering. Good evening. Namaskar. Shabak hair. Sat Sri Akal. We have reached the valedictory session of this 9th International Conference 2023. I hope that this might have been truly delightful and enriching. I, on this last session, I must appreciate the people who have play, played a great role in making this conference a truly memorable one. First of all, uh, I must appreciate Professor Bharat Desai for his kindness to grace today's occasion and share his thoughts with the participants. His words are always sagacious and you might have seen that his words are truly embedded in international law. He has devoted himself fully on the promotion of international law in our country and also in many other countries. It was he who forged friendship with many universities to collaborate in international law, doing research in international law, including Delhi University. It was he who provided opportunity to me to meet Professor Hegre, who is also on the dais. It was he who made me to write, you know, some papers in the areas of uh, climate change as I was thinking that how important is the area of climate change in the current times. And I have also taken interest in uh, writing on renewable energy and all. Uh, as you might have seen that this, there could not have been any other person better than Professor Desai to give the valedictory address today. I must tell you, Professor Desai, that your followers, your friends, and your students have made this international conference a truly successful and memorable one. I thank you once again for sharing your thoughts with us. This Society of International Law is uh, led by Senior Advocate Padam Shri Praveen H. Parikh and uh, I must appreciate his kindness in hosting an inaugural dinner for all of you and uh, perhaps you must, must have enjoyed it. So, although he is not here, but I must profusely appreciate the gracious thing that he had done. Uh, 
Apart from that, I must appreciate today the academic committee members of the Executive Council of Indian Society of International Law, especially Dr. Gandhi, Dr. Johar, uh, Dr. Aftab Alam, Dr. Luther, Dr. Chakka, and the Conference Academic Committee, which has been headed by Professor Hegre. I also appreciate the special panels supported by International Committee of the Red Cross, UNHCR, Center for International Trade and Investment, and WHO to make this conference really international. To further make this uh, conference truly international, I must put on record the support provided by uh, Dr. Sunil Agarwal for roping in South Korean scholars to constitute the Law of the Sea panel in this conference. I appreciate the physical presence during the various sessions of many of our life members, including uh, Professor B.C. Nirmal, uh, Sri Narendar Singh Ji, Vijay Kumar Singh, M.K. Rao, Rashmi Salpekar. Uh, apart from that, Deep Shikhaji. Apart from that, I must also thank Dr. Kishore Singh Ji uh, for gracing many of our programs uh, in this uh, conference. I must take note of all the members of Organizing Committee of International Conference, namely the Deputy Director Sri Vinay Singh Ji and uh, all assistant professors of the society, without whose sincere efforts this conference would not have been successful. Uh, lastly, I must say that the staff members of Indian Society of International Law have done a very good job to do all the things, do all the logistics very successfully. There was no uh, hiccups in the organization of this program, this conference for the last two days and two days and one evening. Uh, I must appreciate all the participants who have come from all over India and abroad to present and participate in this international conference, which has truly made it, you know, a very successful ninth international conference hosted by Indian Society of International Law. And this Society of International Law was established in 1959. And today we have concluded the ninth international conference of our Indian Society. So it's a great journey that we have finally accomplished. Uh, so, uh, as far as I am the treasurer of the society, I have given free hand to organize this international conference uh, with uh, the help of the executive council members. So, this program is also uh, successful because of the support of, I said, Minister of External Affairs, who have given a lot of financial support to finally make it successful. So thank you so much for all of you who, have present, who are present here today and to make this international conference a successful one. Thank you. Jeff. Thank you so much, sir. Now is the much awaited time that is a distribution of certificates. But before that, I request Professor Viji Hege, sir, to propose formal vote of thanks. I'm not going to take much time. Already, uh, uh, Professor uh, Anupam Jha has already mentioned uh, many of these things. First, let me thank him for chairing the valedictory session. And also, I wish to thank my colleague, uh, senior colleague, Professor Bharat Desai. I think his uh, talk uh, actually um, provided the, you know, excellent uh, valedictory uh, sort of an address to a program which we called Ajatika Amut Mahotsav and International Law. So he covered range of issues which in included both 
the global and the Indian context. So I think it was a he gave uh, various uh, preferences to various problems, issues, and why we should take international law seriously. And uh, this is his passion. I know uh, him for many, many decades now. So he has been uh, arguing for why we should take international law seriously. So I think he continues in that uh, mode. And then he has given us a treat for last one hour about this. I'm sure many of you who are here, young scholars, will take it. And I uh, already, uh, Professor Jha has mentioned, but still let me um, thank the President, P.H. Parekh, office bearers and the EC members. And let me also thank Dr. Shikhar Ranjan, who was the Secretary General till recently, who actually formulated and did a lot of good work. And all the chairs of the sessions, including some of our esteemed EC members, who gave time to uh, chair the sessions, and all participants. And particularly young scholars, actually, they thronged the, um, you know, our society, and it was really nice to have them spend time with them. And particularly many foreign delegates, already mentioned by Professor Anupamja, uh, and also who came online. This is a hybrid mode conference, and there are many uh, life members and uh, uh, associate members have actually. Uh, could able to, uh, and many of them have written to us that they could able to watch and then listen to some of the excellent presentations uh, made by many of you here, including many of the foreign members from wherever they are. And then um, let me also thank, I already said it, but still I must say as, as the chair of the organizing committee as constituted by the executive council, uh, thank uh, Dr. Luther Rangreji, uh, Professor Manoj Kumar Sinha, Professor Anupam Jha, of course he is the treasurer, Professor Rashmi Salpekar and Dr. M. Gandhi. These were the constituting the organizing committee. And then we also had a finance committee which was headed by Mr. Uh, Sanjay Parekh. But of course, Anupam Jha, Dr., uh, Professor Anupam Jha is the sort of, uh, you know, who is the one who actually take the most of the burden. And with Professor Manoj Kumar Sinha as part of the uh, the finance committee and then Mr. G. V. Rao and uh, myself uh, constituted this committee which actually could able to arrange this program for uh, three days. Then but at the most time he said but still already I just want to say all our teaching and research staff which included Vinay Kumar Singh, you have met most of them, Dr. Anwar Sadat, Dr. Parneet Kaur, Dr. Kanika Sharma, office staff, Raki Bakshi, Ravinder Singh, Santram, then um, Ravinder, Saurabh, and then uh, Ramesh Singh, of course, all of them have really helped and, uh, you know, in this program. Rapporteurs, particularly, we had three rapporteurs who actually uh, noted down everything. We proposed to put this particular, uh, you know, uh, work by the rapporteurs on the website of the society in the coming days, which include the Surya. Gayatri and Shabnam Khan. Thank you very much, rapporteurs, for being there in all the meetings. Well, our library, as Professor Desai mentioned, we have one of the best uh, international libraries in this part of the world. We have Dr. Meenakshi Bhan, Sanjay, Menaka, and Rahul. I'm sure why I'm saying these names are because you, you young scholars particularly, you all know them, many of them, you have met them, you are all your problems and uh, things like that, you have, they have solved all these problems. But do visit our library, take advantage of that, and then uh, and thank you very much, and come again, and society is yours, and let us all build international law very well. That's one of the motto of the Indian Society of International Law. Thank you very much.